What's up guys, Standard Lifestyle. I have got a ton of stuff to do. This is gonna be a crazy big video for me to shoot all in one week. And uh, by the end of the video, the idea is that this Land Rover Discovery is gonna finally move forward and backward under its own power. This video is brought to you by Empire Abrasives. I still have a lot of fabrication that needs to be done on the Discovery to make it trail ready. Cut off wheels, grinding discs, flap discs. These are all really important products that I get from Empire Abrasives in order to complete these different fabrication tasks that I have in this series. Empire Abrasives has the best prices that I have found while still maintaining high quality standard on the products that they sell. If you click the link in the description or if you use our coupon code, it lets companies like Empire Abrasives know that we're worth the investment and you really help propel the growth of this channel. Here's how I think this video is gonna go. I think that this is gonna take way longer than I think it's going to. I have been standing here making a list of things that have to be done in order to make this Land Rover Discovery drivable for the first time just to get to the next step step of testing and seeing if these different systems that I've built are gonna work. And uh, I'm giving myself a week. <laughs> so I like to do two videos a week if I can. This is gonna be one full week of just doing this video. And if it takes longer than a week, then you guys aren't gonna see a video for a little while. I really wanna get this stuff done. I wanna get this disco on the road. And so I'm just gonna start going one by one. We're gonna work down our way down this list and I'm gonna do everything I can to try to make this video a reasonable length. But we'll see what kinds of problems I come across as we're doing this, because I wanna share all that stuff with you. So buckle in, there's a lot that's gonna be going on in this video, I hope you enjoy it. I'm gonna start by pulling off all the wheels and tires and getting everything lined up as close as possible. I'm gonna break out the lasers, I'm gonna use these marks on the floor that we established at the beginning of this series, and I'm gonna to try to get everything really close to center, and I'm gonna keep the axles close to what I think ride height is gonna be. When I'm dialing in a single or double triangulated four link, I like to remove one of the upper links because I think it's a lot easier to center everything where it's supposed to be. And then all I have to do is lengthen or shorten that last link and bolt it in. Now that I'm done with the low hanging fruit, I can figure out how I want to wrap up this problem with the wheel speed sensors. If you've been watching this series and you know that when one of the earlier episodes, I make a lot of reference to the fact that I want to keep traction control, I want to keep ABS, and it all depends on the accuracy and the performance of these wheel speed sensors. I'm removing the front wheel speed sensor first so I can use a caliper and measure the depth and then make a plan on how I want to put together a bracket system for the rear. The video conditions on the back of the disco leave a lot to be desired. It's kind of dark, it's hard to get the right angle. So what I wanted to do is draw what, it, what I'm planning. So as you guys see this come together, hopefully this will be this will come across in the video in a way that makes sense. So this red part here is the bracket that I'm gonna try to build. The green part is the rear wheel speed sensor. This weird dotted thing that I drew here is our tone ring. Um, it's a 60 tooth, which replicates what the stock tone ring is. We are using the Land Rover Discovery wheel speed sensor. And what I did is I measured the front hub. So I measured what the distance is between where this mounts to the tip of this tooth. And that's the measurement that I came up with. This bracket that I'm building in the rear is basically just gonna have three holes in it. I'm gonna cut it in a way that it fits. I'm gonna bolt it onto these two bolts on the hub. And then I'm gonna drill a third hole, which is where we're gonna mount the sensor. I'm gonna oversize the holes a little bit so that I can loosen and tighten things and I can try to uh, get as close to this measurement as possible. And as you saw, all I did was stick the backside of our caliper in there and then I, uh, once I was able to bottom it out, I was able to get an accurate measurement. I'm gonna do the exact same thing on the back here. I'm just gonna plop that in there. I'm gonna push it down. I'm gonna try to get the exact same measurement as I did on the front because I can't find any tolerances or specs online for how close or how far away the sensor needs to be in order to still properly function. So I'm just gonna replicate what I know works in a factory application and we're gonna see what happens. The 
Building simple brackets out of angle iron might seem crude, and it certainly is, but this is one of those examples where you can save some time here because this is building something that no one is going to see, and well, I guess you guys are gonna see because it's gonna be on the internet, but it's something you're not gonna look at very often because it's gonna be hidden underneath the brakes, and I wanna get this project done. So we're gonna save some time here because we're gonna need it later on in order to get this video out. And at the end of the day, if this is something that I'm unhappy with, I can always just come back, pull this brake apart, and I can redo this later on down the road. Once I was able to check the depth with my caliper, I was able to determine what the difference was from where I'm at now and where I need to be. So I just made a shim out of some material that I had laying around that was a close thickness for what I need to make up that gap, and then I tack welded it on there, redrilled the hole, and now we're in the ballpark. With this bracket all mounted up, I was able to check the depth of the caliper, and it looks like we have a .003 difference from the measurement I got from the front to the measurement that we we're gonna have in the rear. This is really, really close. Three thousandths of an inch to me has gotta be well within spec, so we're gonna run it and see what happens. Got a few things checked off the list, which is feeling really good. We got our ABS, well, not an ABS mount, but our uh, the mounts for our wheel speed sensors done. We got our charcoal canister complete. And now the next thing I want to tackle on this list is going to take a little bit of time. I'm trying to do all the timing, all the time consuming stuff first. And that is going to be fabricate a spacer to lift up the front of the disco. I don't like the height that we're seeing between the front and the rear. The rear is definitely going to sink down once we add a spare tire and a whole bunch of weight and stuff back there, but it's not going to sink down enough to counteract how low the front ended up being once I put all the, the new axles and all these new brackets and stuff in here. So I'm kind of lucky because we don't have to use like a spacer in the spring because of the way that this is all put together. There's a lower coil bucket that bolts on to a bracket that I welded on. All I have to do is build a spacer that's gonna go in there. It's gonna be super simple. This is already like a two inch lift spring. I don't wanna go with a stiffer spring in the front and I also don't wanna buy a whole lot of stuff. So I'm just gonna use scrap laying around here to build a spacer that's gonna go underneath and there, there's no cons to this. All it's gonna do is give me a little bit of extra lift in the front and it's not gonna cost a whole lot of money. As the saying goes, there's more than one way to skin a cat and there certainly is more than one way to lift the front or rear suspension on a four x four. I'm choosing to use spacers. You could definitely use springs. I could be using springs, but I want this thing done soon. I want it to be done inexpensive. I've already blown my budget way out of the water on this swap. So we're gonna just use materials that I have lying around. I'm gonna build a really simple design so we can get this thing on the road. And this is another one of those things that later on I might come back to and change. But first, I wanna build a concept because I wanna see how close I am with this size. And then if I do go to rebuild these in the future, I will know to adjust it up or down a little bit based on whatever my needs are. Since I'm already cutting and painting, this feels like a great time to cut the spacers that I need in order to give the proper width to fill the discrepancy between these joints I got from Barnes Four Wheel Drive and the joints that come stock on the Land Rover Discovery. I wanna let all these painted parts dry. I wanna give them a little bit of extra time so I can handle them and install them. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm gonna install something called a shock bumper. This isn't actually a shock bumper. This is a random bushing, but we have some clearance issues that I wanna try and mitigate. So today's gonna be experimental. I'm gonna cut these bushings in half. If I can get this to work in a way that I think it should, then I can order some real shock bumpers. But um, for now, we're just gonna use these generic shock or these generic bushings that I had laying around in the shop. And the whole concept here is that I've got to do something to limit the up travel of the tire because it just goes too high. It's too big. This vehicle isn't made for 37s and we're trying to shoehorn some 37s onto it. So I do have a bump stop already in here. And if <laughs> it's gonna be hard to see, it's back here. And if you saw earlier in the series, I made these bump stops work great whenever the axle is coming all the way up. So if it's flat and I'm gonna be bottoming out, those inside bump stops are gonna take care of that motion, but whenever the tire flexes all the way up, it's not close enough. So in order to try to get 
everything that I want, I'm gonna add an extra bump stop essentially with these shock bumpers. So I'm gonna put this onto the shaft. That bottom part, unfortunately, is not coming off. I've tried, I've pulled these off, I've put them in the vise, I cannot get that to come off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slice this in half so I can fit it on there, hold it together with a hose clamp for now, and then we're gonna cycle our suspension. We're gonna see if this is gonna get us what we need, and if it is, then I can order some axle, some actual shock bumpers and figure out how to install those in the future. But for now, we're just experimenting. We're gonna see what we can make work. I wanna be super clear why I think I need two different stages of bump stops. So you can see that the passenger side is drooped down. Is uh, it, That's as far as I want it to go. I don't have the, order, the uh, limit straps ordered for it yet because I wanna wait until I get my drive shaft in there so then I can see where it starts to bind. Then I'll be comfortable ordering the correct length because at this point, it might be binding already by the time it gets down here. So I need to bring that down travel up. But I do know that this is as far down as I will possibly want it to go because I probably only have an inch more or so of uh, shock travel. So with this side all the way down, I put this side up about as high as I would want it to be. It's gonna go up just a hair higher once there's the weight of the vehicle on it, but I have plenty of wiggle room there. So I'm not gonna have any surprises on the trail where it's trying to like rip off a fender flare or anything like that. So the reason that I have two different stages of bump stop is if you watched earlier in the series, I set up the factory bump stops to protect us whenever the entire front of the vehicle squishes down. So not one side or the other, just the entire thing. So if I go over a whoop or a big bump or something like that, and the front comes down real hard, it's gonna nail the factory bump stops. The problem is the factory bump stops are inbound so far that they won't protect us, well, they won't protect our fenders essentially. So whenever there's up travel, like you see right here, the factory bump stops aren't protecting us in any way. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. So you can see the factory bump stop up there, and then you can see the bump stop pad. There's still a huge gap there. But whenever I put this shock bumper in here, the shock bumper makes it to where it bottoms out on the shock softly, and it protects the fender. So that's why we have two different stages of bump stop because one set of bump stops, the OEM one, protects us in one scenario, and then these ones that are gonna be on the shocks are gonna protect us in another scenario. Now, this is just a test. This is just to see how close this size bushing would get us, and now I can go online and find a bushing that's comparable and order it. Plan A is to figure out how to get the eyelet off the bottom of the shock. Um, I, I put this in a vise once before. I could not get the bottom of that to budge. So I'm gonna contact Bill Stein and find out if there's a way that they recommend that I do that, or if I have to send it to them, I don't know yet. But um, plan B would be get the right size bump stop. I'll have to split it like that and then find some sort of a compound that is really good at, at, at bonding the polyurethane back together. So as you can see, this is just a test. This is just to see if this is gonna work. This is something I've been thinking about and it looks like it's gonna work fine. I just need to order the right parts and hopefully assemble them in the right way to where I can get these results. These are exactly what I'm looking for. I wanna to try to have my cake and eat it too. And if it takes two stages of bump stops, then so be it. Also, if you look close, I put my little spacers in there. They aren't pretty. This is also just a concept that I'm testing. I wanna see how well these work on the trail before I button up this idea. So I don't know, it could take a few trips before I decide that this is too tall or too short or whatever. So I might be building a whole nother set. Whenever I build the other set, they're gonna be much more refined. This is a very simple, basic spacer. I want something that's gonna blend in a little nicer than this. But for now, this will at least be a way for me to get it on the trail, get it on the road, and see how I like this height. of these problems taken care of, it's time to deal with what is probably going to be the biggest problem of this entire build, and that is the strange offset of the front and rear axle versus the strange offset of this transfer case. 
Lucky for me, Adam's Drive Shaft had a solution. They also had the yokes that I would need in order to accommodate this strange solution. So let's talk about what it's gonna take for me to put all this together and see how it works. I have a potentially huge problem with the drivetrain of this rig, where this is very experimental. And I wanna take a minute just to talk to you guys why I have a big problem, what plan A, B, and C are, and just how I, I wanna move forward with this issue. And hopefully, we can get it taken care of with plan A, but we'll see. The problem is, with American 4x4s, you usually see the power go through the transmission, into the transfer case, and then there's a center outlet on the back of the transfer case. So the pool of rear axles that you're gonna find here in America for 4x4s is going to be, well, even, even two-wheel drives, but you're gonna see a usually centered or slightly off-centered rear axle, but it'll just be it's very slightly off-centered, like an inch or two. So whenever you work with four and four by fours, it's way more common to see them set up like this Land Rover Discovery, where the front and rear outputs are offset of the center line of the rest of the drivetrain. So the center line of your transmission and engine. The problem with that is that I have way more access in the United States to the United States style front and rear axles, where the rear is usually somewhat centered up and uh, the front will either be passenger or driver. We already took care of the front in some capacity because it was a driver side front axle. I wanted to make sure that I could maintain a high pinion front. So I bought that driver side high pinion front. I cut it up, made it a passenger side. And this is great because at least it's on the right side of the uh, vehicle. But because these super duties are built in a way to where they jam that uh, differential so close to the knuckle and so close to the inner C, it makes it to where it's still a crazy offset in the front too. So this is what the potential problem is. This is an all wheel drive vehicle and I'm gonna have some crazy angles on these drive shafts, front and rear. And they're when I'm at freeway speeds, I mean, it's going through a whole lot of offset joints. What I did here is whatever, I started planning this build, I emailed my, ax, or my drive shaft manufacturer which is Adams, that's someone that I've been dealing with for years because they make really strong four x four specific drive shafts. And I've been working with them closely this entire time. Whenever I was offsetting this front axle, I was going doing emails with uh, Dan and we were just talking about this crazy offset in the rear. And I was asking him, am I gonna have to cut up the rear and offset the center of the rear axle? And after talking about it and talking about what I'm gonna be doing with it, we determined that we should be able to get away with doing a CV joint on both sides of the drive shaft. For those of you who are new, this is a CV joint or a double carton joint. And then usually on the other side, you'll have just a U joint. And in this case, we have this on the front and the rear. And we had to do the same thing with the front drive shaft because of the crazy offset of that center section on the front. So this is very experimental. This is not very common. It, it's it's not so uncommon that you never see it. You will occasionally see this, but you'll usually see it in something that's like a rock crawler full time. Something that is not gonna be driven down the freeway. I anticipate I'm gonna have some vibrations that I'm gonna have to try and smooth out. If I can't get them smooth enough, then plan B, because I think that the problem will be the rear. Plan B would be to just get a transfer case out of an American vehicle. It sucks because I really like this transfer case. They're notorious for being super strong. I like that it's all wheel drive and four wheel drive. There's a lot of reasons I want to keep this T case, but if I can't get rid of the vibrations, I will put an American case in here that'll have a center outlet in the rear. The good news there is as long as I can get the right uh, flange to adapt to the back of the case, I don't even have to get new drive shafts made. I mean, this, this setup with these dual CVs will work in that instance as well. It'll just be a lot better because they won't be offset side to side and offset because it's gonna be going down to the axle on top of it. So we've got a big uphill battle here. I think plan B will be a new transfer case. And plan C would be if I can't figure out a way to adapt a transfer case um, and I don't wanna pull out the whole engine transmission and transfer case, then plan C would be to cut the rear axle and offset it or have a custom housing built and just save this whole rear axle for a future project. So these are big consequences. I'm taking a lot of gambles with a lot of the choices that I've made on this, but I will make a one ton axle swap work with this Land Rover Discovery. I don't care what I have to do. I will make it work. I've, I've known these 
these p potential gambles. I've known these potential issues since the beginning of this build. It is not gonna make me back out of it. It's just now we're at a point where we've got everything bolted in there. And at the end of this video, whenever we finally drive this thing out of the shop, um, as long as the brakes work good enough for me to stop somewhat safely, I'm gonna get it up to 30, 40 miles an hour and I'm gonna see how it feels. Do I feel any vibrations? If I don't, you're gonna see someone cheering in their Land Rover Discovery <laughs> driving down the road. But if I do, then we're gonna start talking about plan B. Adapting the brakes from the Super Duty to the Discovery was actually pretty easy. The front brake lines had already been replaced with aftermarket, so they were definitely long enough. And all I had to do was pull out the OEM Discovery brake bolt and replace it with the Super Duty bolt. The rears weren't quite long enough, so I went and had some custom lines made. And I did the same thing that I did with the front. I used a Land Rover Discovery sized line that was a little bit longer with the bolt from the Ford Super Duty. so close to being able to drive down the road it is driving me crazy so we're going to skip a couple of these steps this thing is together enough that it can go down the road the next big thing we need to fix is the steering and i'll show you what problem we have so the way i have the pitman arm set up it's a good clearance and whatnot but i limit the joint that i put here this joint right here more one way than the other way because of the way that I had my jack stands placed when I built it, I couldn't test it. So I took a gamble and I lost. <laughs> I'll show you what the limitation is right now real quick. And then I think what we're gonna do is I'm gonna fix this tomorrow. But right now I wanna take this, bolt the tires on it and I wanna go drive it. So I'll show you what the problem is. And then uh, we will throw this thing together and go down the road. So just in case you weren't sure what you're looking at, it turns more towards the passenger. It'll actually go to lock than it does to driver. So right now it's cranked to driver and see if we have enough light to see this. Woo, it is dark. See that gap right there? That's not good. That's a, a stop that is designed to keep it from steering too far in one direction. And we wanna build it to where we hit the stop on both sides. Right now, we're being stopped by the flexibility of the joint that is on my pitman arm. There's two ways to address this, and we will talk about how to address it tomorrow, but right now, I wanna bolt these tires on, and I wanna get this thing going on the road. Feels a little floaty side to side. I don't have the rear sway bar hooked up right now. Ooh. I did change out the muffler while I was working on everything. So it sounds off. It sounds the best it ever has. It sounds like a V8 now. And it's just got good tone. It's not super noisy. Oh, when you get on it a little bit though, it makes some tone. It sounds really good. Twenty-five, thirty. 
So I didn't put the rear sway bar back on yet. It, amazingly, not a lot of vibrations. We got up to about 30 miles an hour. I mean, it felt like it did before, to be completely honest. Uh, I didn't put the rear sway bar back on because there's a bunch of clearance issues, so I'm just gonna have to deal with that later. I mean, it stops. It doesn't stop fast, but it definitely, it is stopping, so we can continue to test a little bit. All right, let's get turned around, head back to the shop, and inspect, see if anything has come unbolted or undone. I did not sleep very well last night, as I'm sure you could imagine, because I have a one-ton Land Rover in my shop. I'm super pumped about this thing, and I thought about it all night after that little bit of driving that we did. Unfortunately, a lot of things have changed since last night. One, I was going to take you for a real drive today. We were going to go drive it in the light so you could actually see what the heck is going on, and we could see this outside of the shop, but it is raining cats and dogs, and I have unpainted parts everywhere. Not to mention the fact that it's not braking great. It does stop, for sure, but I don't want to risk it not stopping 100% what it could be or should be, and then risking an accident. So we're going to have to wait till we do our for real test drive. Uh, but that's going to be coming up very soon, in the next couple of weeks for sure. Not to mention the fact that I completely forgot about insurance and current registration. So it is like illegal in many ways, and there's not even a rear bumper. So I don't want to risk destroying this thing or someone destroying me or whatever else. So we're going to have to wait for a legit test drive. Um, but in the meantime... I am going to be fixing a bunch of things. Unfortunately, that's not gonna happen today. I usually make videos seven days a week. This week, I'm gonna to turn today into a family day. So I'm just gonna shoot this a little bit right here, and I'm gonna go enjoy the rest of the day with my family. So in the next one, we will probably be fixing that steering issue. I'm gonna do a lot of research and try to find a master cylinder that is larger that will bolt into this, because this needs a larger master cylinder because of the really large brakes, so it's just not sized correctly. Then we are going to build the Ultimate Overlander Tire Carrier. I've been wanting to build a tire carrier for this ever since I bought it, and we've got this beautiful blank canvas back here. I've got a ton of ideas I've never seen before, so we're gonna be doing that very soon too. I hope to have this driving down the freeway in the next couple of weeks. So you're gonna be seeing a lot of videos of this in the near future, and I look forward to sharing my ideas with you guys. I wanna take a couple minutes. We're gonna breeze through some of the comments from the last video. And the last video was tricks to choose the perfect axle gear ratio. First comment is from Will Young. I have 538 gears in my Suzuki Samurai with stock axles and can honestly say the pinion is downright adorable. Kinda of makes me nervous wheeling on 33s. Thankfully I have a Wagoneer Dana 44 and an 88 to replace soon. Dude, I totally know what you're talking about. They are adorable. When you get to the smaller axles like what's on Samurais and whatnot, Holy cow, when you go to a 538, it looks like a rotary bit. So thanks for the comment, I appreciate you watching, brother. Next comment is from Nutty Nick. Keep an eye on the Land Rover transfer case ratios. As strong as they are, most that I am aware of are not one-to-one -one in high range. I think they may have done this to be able to run smaller diffs, i.e. 3.54 bigger pinion than a lower gear set. So, well, I think anyway. So thank you for the comment and you're absolutely right. I didn't even this I didn't even consider this because most modern 4x4s are chain driven transfer cases. High range is always a one to one. It's I've never seen a chain driven case that is not a one to one high range. So this is a gear driven and I forgot all about the fact that this is a gear driven T case and uh, I did not take into account that in gear-driven T-cases, a lot of times the high range isn't exactly one-to-one. -one. And in this one, it's not one-to-one. -one. So what does that mean? That means that my highway speeds that I was estimating in the last uh, video are not going to be accurate. They're going to be slightly off. So in the future video, probably the test drive video, we will calculate what to expect before we go out in the real world. And then we'll use like a GPS or something to see how accurate uh, that estimation is. But I, a lot of you guys commented about this, and this is something that I just completely, it, it blew right by me. I just completely forgot about the fact that it's a gear-driven T-case. So that's something that we'll be talking about more in the future. Next comment is from K Rover one or Krover. I'm assuming it's K Rover, like you're a Land Rover owner. Interesting, my D2 with 35s and 410s is at 2,400 RPM at 70. I'd like to eventually go lower but I may change the gearing and the transfer case instead. This kind of touches back to what we were just talking about. I think that um, if you're using the factory Land Rover Discovery axles, I would not go lower than a 410 
because the ring and pinions already, it's just small. It's in my opinion, it's too small for a vehicle of its size because you can put a lot of stuff in there and make it really heavy. So a uh, 410 is, or 411 is as low as I would go. And I think you're on the right track. I would, if you want to go lower, I would definitely start with the T case. And uh, if that doesn't satisfy what you're going after or what you're looking for, I would look for bigger axles. Last comment today is from Christopher Pia, P-I-A, Pia, Pia, something like that. I have a 1990 YJ, Dana 30 up front, uh, Ford 8.8 in the rear. I run a 488, I'm running 488 gears on a 35 inch tall tire. My crawl ratio is 50.83 to one. I'd like to get to 80 plus. What's the best route to go? Bigger front axle with 538s and a different T case, or is there a better way to achieve this? Great video as always, and I look forward to what is next. So, a few different ways you can look at this. Um, I mean, it's great to go with a bigger front axle, right? But I would only do that if you were gonna go bigger than a 35. If you're gonna hang around that 35 range, I mean, YJs and TJs are pretty light right out of the box. So there's a ton of forgiveness with that front axle. That year YJ, I am 99% sure, came with a high pinion 30 front. So you're already on the right track there. Um, I honestly would, I would do what I could to run those axles. Well, you're clearly gonna keep the rear. I would do what I could to keep a Dana 30 front with a 35. It's gonna give you the most clearance up there. Um, you're not gonna have to deal with extra added weight. And it's one of the big benefits of having a YJ and a TJ in the first place is like that, that light weight, you wanna keep it light. So I think that gearing down with the transfer case would be the move that I would go. Um, with my gears, my, my transfer case is at a 5.44 to one, cause it's a four speed. So it's a 272 to one, which should be the same as what you have. Plus it has a doubler on top of it. So two to one compounding that 272 gives me 544. And my final crawl is like 117. If I went and if I didn't have a 538 gear in the axle and I had a 488, I bet you I'd be at like 90 to one somewhere in that ballpark. So if you went for a 544 to one, or you could probably find a six to one and like a uh, Atlas two speed, if you wanted to just maintain a two speed T case. And uh, that would get you in the range that you're looking for. I would, I would say if it's a manual 80 to one would be minimum. If you want to go like serious rock crawling type stuff and you can do somewhat serious rocks and 35s and a YJ, if you set everything up slippery and you have the right gear range. So I don't know. For me, I would try to stay as light as possible and I would probably just upgrade the T case and see what you can do with that. And then worst case scenario, if you upgrade that T case and then you end up having problems with that Dana 30 in the future, you could throw chromolys in it or there's lots of upgrades for them. And if that doesn't work, then you could always upgrade to a different front end later on too. But I think that uh, starting with the transfer case is what I would do. Thank you so much for watching the video. This was a lot of work and I enjoyed every minute of it. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. If you did, make sure you click the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thank you so much to Empire Abrasives for sponsoring this video. And if you guys are in the market for any abrasives, whether it's cutoff wheels, grinding discs, flap discs, any of that stuff that we use as fabricators and as gearheads, the best prices that I've seen and the highest quality per dollar is definitely Empire Abrasives. So check them out, use our coupon code, use our link below, and uh, you can save yourself a little bit of extra money if you're a first time customer. If you wanna help support the channel, you can go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We have t-shirts, hats, neck gaiters. I've got uh, my wife's testing out some Dirtbag Mafia merch. I don't know if it's on the website yet, but uh, I'm when after this is wrapped up, I'll go make sure that it is. So if you guys are interested in any of this kind of stuff, um, you can go on our website and help support us there. We also have a link to our Patreon account and if you want to join our Facebook group, it is Dirtbag Mafia. And we're working on, you guys, a lot of you guys are asking for Dirtbag Mafia merch. We're working on stickers and we already have some stickers, but we're working on windshield banners and, you know, sweatshirts and stuff. So there's a bunch of things associated with this Dirtbag Mafia Facebook group. And uh, I love interacting with you guys on there. So if you're interested in our Facebook group, definitely check it out. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Your Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.